With 2,200 people aboard the Titanic, there was no shortage of interesting stories to tell. Some made it out, most didn't. So I'm devoting this video to a handful of famous stories from the Titanic. You find these people pop up in the films and TV shows, some more frequently than others. There is no one that survived the Titanic who wouldn't have that event burned into their memory for the rest of their lives. Keep in mind, the people I have listed here are only a handful of people who are on that ship. Technically, I've listed more than 50 because some are grouped together. So if I have missed anyone out that you hope to find here, please be sure to put their story in the comments. You can find the details of the passengers and crew members on the website Encyclopedia Titanica. Most of the details of these people's lives were sourced from there. Shall we ever be able to look at the world in quite the same way? I'll never see it as safe and snug, if that's what you mean. Take it to see Mr. Murdoch. Let's stretch her legs. Yes, sir. Captain Edward Smith was known as the Millionaire's Captain. Born in Staffordshire in 1850, Smith first went to sea at the age of 13 and started working for the White Star Line age 30. In 1877, he got his first command of a ship, the Republic. That same year, he married Sarah E. Pennington and they had a daughter named Helen. He also served in the Boer War at the turn of the century. He was captaining the Olympic when the Hawke collision occurred. During the Titanic's departure from Southampton Dock, the ship nearly collided with the SS New York, but it was Smith's experience that avoided another collision. On the evening of 14th of April, Smith attended a dinner party held in his honour by the Widener family. He retired to bed shortly before Charles Lightoller transferred bridge duty to William Murdoch. The collision with the iceberg at 11.40pm awoke Smith. He and Thomas Andrews inspected the damage and then Smith gave the order to prepare the lifeboats for evacuation. Smith was last seen on the bridge of the Titanic, giving the order to abandon ship. Some accounts report that he emotionally shut down as the chaos mounted. There is speculation as to whether he shot himself on the bridge. However, his body was never recovered, so the truth will never be certain. He was 62. Lieutenant Henry Wilde was Titanic's chief officer. He was born in 1872 in Liverpool. He joined the White Star Line as a junior officer, having gained experience on sailing vessels and working on the Maranhan Steamship Company. He was widowed in 1910 after his wife presumably died of scarlet fever along with two infant sons. At the time of his death, he had four surviving children. Like Captain Smith, he was also on the Olympic during the Hawke collision. Wilde was brought in to be chief officer of the Titanic at the last minute likely a move by the White Star Line to have their most experienced officers aboard the new ship, who already had served on the Olympic. His bridge duties took place between 2am to 6am and 2pm to 6pm. As such, he was not on the bridge when the collision happened. During the evacuation, he assisted Lightoller in releasing the even-numbered boats. He asked Lightoller where the firearms were kept, and sought arming the officers with revolvers. Wilde insisted that Lightoller leave in Collapsible D, but Lightoller refused. Wilde was last seen trying to launch the last two collapsible boats, and his body was never found. It is likely that when the first funnel fell, he was swept away from the ship and lost. He was 39 years old. Do you ever find those binoculars for the lookout? I haven't seen them since Southampton. Lieutenant William McMaster Murdoch was Titanic's first officer. He was born in Dalbeatie, Scotland in 1873. Seafaring was part of his family's heritage, and his own father was a captain. His brothers pursued other careers, and he was the only one to pursue a maritime career. He went to sea age 15 on the Charles Coatsworth for a five-year apprenticeship. His father was proud of him for sailing past Cape Horn on the south tip of Chile, as he believed no one was a true sailor if they hadn't passed it successfully. He became an officer in the Naval Reserves before he was hired by the White Star Line in 1900. He married Ada Banks in 1907, but they had no children. He was aboard the Olympic during her maiden voyage and the Hawk collision, and testified at the inquiry. He was meant to serve as chief officer on the Titanic, but the last-minute reshuffle made him first officer instead. 
Murdoch was the most senior officer on the bridge when the ship collided with the iceberg and closed all the watertight doors on the ship. He was in charge of evacuating the ship using the odd-numbered lifeboats on the starboard side. During the evacuation of Collapsible Sea, he fired warning shots from a revolver given to him by Officer Wilde. It was rumoured for years afterwards that he committed suicide as the ship began the final plunge. His body was never recovered, so it can't be confirmed or denied. He was 39 years old. Sub-Lieutenant Charles Lightoller was Titanic's second officer and the most senior officer to survive the sinking. He was born in Chorley, Lancashire in 1874. He began his seafaring career aged 13 when he apprenticed on the Primrose Hill. He experienced more than his fair share of maritime struggles, surviving storms and a cyclone where he was shipwrecked for eight days. Before he joined the White Star Line, he unsuccessfully prospected for gold in the Yukon and had to work his way home across Canada. In 1900, he met and married Sylvia Hawley Wilson. He was meant to serve as first officer on the Titanic, but the sudden reshuffle meant he was demoted to second officer instead. He relieved the bridge duty to Murdoch at 10pm and was awoken by the collision. During the evacuation, he was tasked with lowering lifeboats from the port side. Due to the noise of engines expelling steam from the boilers, Lightoller had to cup his hand against his mouth to confirm evacuating women and children first. Smith only nodded and Lightoller gained notoriety for sending away boats half full with only women and children while leaving swathes of male passengers on deck. Lightoller barely survived the sinking. As he was trying to free Collapsible A, he jumped into the water and was nearly sucked under by a flooding ventilation shaft and blasted back to the surface by an exploding boiler. Following that, he barely avoided being crushed by the first funnel. He organised people who had scrambled to the overturned Collapsible B and he was the last person to board the Carpathia when she arrived. At the inquiries, he defended Captain Smith and Murdoch's actions. Lightoller continued sailing throughout the rest of his life. He served as a naval officer in World War I, where he earned the Distinguished Service Cross for shooting down a Zeppelin. He resigned from the White Star Line after 20 years' service. In 1929, he remodelled an Admiralty steam launch into a yacht which he named the Sundowner. In June 1940, Lightoller refused to relinquish the Sundowner so the Navy could use it to evacuate troops stranded on the beach at Dunkirk. He instead sailed it to Dunkirk himself and saved over 130 soldiers. He served in the Home Guard for the rest of the war, but lost two out of his three sons. Lightoller died on the 8th of September 1952 of heart disease. He was 78. Sorry, no passengers on the bridge. No passengers allowed. You're the second passenger tonight who's been here. A young woman tried to enter the wireless room earlier. Herbert Pittman was Titanic's third officer. He was born in 1877 in Somerset and was nicknamed Bert throughout his life. He joined the Merchant Navy aged 18 and joined the White Star Line in 1906 becoming an officer on the Titanic at the start of 1912. He was on the stern of the ship with Murdoch on the 10th of April, during the near miss with the New York. His duties during the voyage mostly involved determining the ship's position. He noted that Captain Smith was delaying turning the ship north on the 14th of April to avoid potential ice fields, as well as the cancelled lifeboat drill. He was awoken by the ship hitting the iceberg. As he came to the bridge, he saw firemen coming onto the well deck with their belongings, who told him their rooms were flooding. He was ordered by Murdoch to man lifeboat 5, shaking hands with him before leaving. Pittman regretted not being able to go back and save those in the water. He participated in the inquiries afterwards. Pittman continued serving, but became a purser as his eyesight became more deteriorated. He married Mildred Coleman in 1922 and retired from 50 years of seafaring in 1946. He died aged 84 in December 1961 of a subarachnoid hemorrhage in Pitcombe, Somerset. Sub-Lieutenant Joseph Boxall was Titanic's fourth officer. He was born in July 1884 in Hull, Yorkshire. He joined his first ship aged 15, apprenticing aboard a bark which sailed all over the world. In 1907, he joined the White Star Line and served as sixth officer on the Oceanic a year later. After a few years serving on ships travelling between Britain and Australia, he was assigned to the Titanic in January 1912, arriving in Belfast in March. His role was divided between watches, navigation and assisting crewmen and passengers. Boxall was en route to the bridge when he heard the lookouts sounding three bells to indicate an iceberg. He reached the bridge at the moment of collision. 
He was told to inspect the forward deck, where a steerage passenger handed him a large piece of ice. He returned to the bridge 15 minutes later and was told to work out the ship's position so the captain could give it to the wireless operators. Boxall worked with Quartermaster George Arthur Rowe in firing off distress rockets. Boxall was tasked with manning lifeboat 2. With room left in the boat, Boxall asked the ladies if they should go back and help survivors out of the water, but the ladies refused. In the darkness, Boxall set off green flares to keep the lifeboats together and signalled the Carpathia when she arrived. He told Captain Rostrin that the ship had gone down at around 2.30am. Boxall later recalled at the inquiries that he saw another vessel on the horizon, but it never responded to their distress calls. During World War I, he was promoted to Lieutenant Commander. He married in 1919 to Marjorie Beddles, but they had no children. During the filming of A Night to Remember, he was brought on as a technical advisor, despite his growing health problems. He attended the premiere and later recalled his experience to the BBC on the 50th anniversary of the sinking. Boxall died in April 1967, aged 83. He was the last surviving Titanic officer and asked for his ashes to be scattered where it was believed the Titanic had gone down. Oh, you don't want to bastard, do you? You have me the whole lot of them. Who the bloody hell are you anyway to be giving orders around here? Sub-Lieutenant Harold Lowe was Titanic's fifth officer. He was born in Conwy, Wales in 1882. He ran away to sea aged 14, refusing his father's apprenticeship. He served along the coast of West Africa for five years before joining the White Star Line not long before being assigned to the Titanic. This being his first North Atlantic crossing, he was made fifth officer instead of third. Lowe was unfamiliar with the other officers. On the 14th of April, he would help chart a course for the Titanic at noon. He was not awakened by the collision, but he claimed he never slept much at sea anyway, and heard the frantic movements outside his cabin. During the launch of Lifeboat 5, he caught J. Bruce Ismay shouting orders at the other crew. Lowe, who may or may not have known who Ismay was, yelled at him to get out of the way and calm down, asserting his authority as an officer. He was ordered to man Lifeboat 14 and had to fire warning shots to prevent others from trying to jump in from B-deck. He gathered five boats together to redistribute passengers so there was enough room to go back for survivors. Unfortunately, he waited too long out of fears the boat would be swamped. Lowe sailed towards the Carpathia when it arrived, towing a collapsible. During the inquiries, Lowe was noted to be flippant to questions he found ridiculous. When an American inquirer asked him what icebergs were made from, Lowe replied bluntly, Ice, I suppose, sir? Lowe married Ellen Whitehouse in 1913 and had two children. He served in the First World War and was promoted to commander in the Royal Naval Reserve. He retired in 1931 and volunteered as an air raid warden until he lost the use of his legs. Lowe died of hypertension in May 1944 in Degan, Wales. He was 61 years old. Is there anyone there? Yes, what do you see? Iceberg, right ahead! Thank you. Sub-Lieutenant James Moody was Titanic's sixth officer and the youngest out of all the other officers. He was born in 1887 in Scarborough, a seaside town on the Yorkshire coast. Unlike the other officers who apprenticed from their mid-teens, Moody attended King Edward VII Nautical School in London and graduated with a master's in 1911. One of his first duties was serving on the Oceanic before he was transferred to the Titanic. He worked the 8am to 12am and 8pm to 12pm watches. Moody was thus on the bridge when the iceberg was spotted. He answered the telephone call from the crow's nest about the sighting. Rather than be sent away in a lifeboat, Moody stayed behind to evacuate as many as possible. He was last seen by Charles Lightoller minutes before the ship went down, trying to have launched the final collapsibles. It's likely he was either crushed by a falling funnel or swept into the water and lost. His body was never recovered. He was 24 years old. Yes, sir. Why aren't you wearing your lifeboat? Well, the passengers mustn't think I'm scared. Let them see you wearing it. Put it on, child. For your own sake, too. Violet Jessup was a stewardess on the Titanic, working primarily in first class. Jessup's experience of working with the White Star Line was unique, in that she was not only aboard the Titanic when it sank, and the Olympic during the Hawk collision, but she was also aboard the HMHS Britannic when it sank as well. On the Britannic, she was in a lifeboat that was sucked into a propeller, but she escaped the boat in time and survived, although with a fractured skull. Jessup had been given a prayer by a passenger during the Titanic voyage that would protect her from fire and water. She was asked to board lifeboat 16 to demonstrate its safety. An officer gave her a baby to look after. On the Carpathia, the baby's mother, who had been separated from them, took the baby back without thanking her. 
Jessup married for a brief time in her late thirties, but who her husband was is unknown. They were not together at the time of her death. She lived in a cottage in Suffolk after her retirement, and was interviewed in 1958 during the release of A Night to Remember. The unsinkable Miss Jessup died in May 1971 of heart failure in her Suffolk home, aged 83. I say we go back! No! It's our lives now, not theirs. And I'm in charge of this boat, madam. Now row! Quartermaster Robert Hitchens was at the helm of the Titanic when she struck the iceberg. Hitchens was a 29-year-old Cornish man, one of six quartermasters on the Titanic. This was his first North Atlantic voyage, but he was still an experienced sailor. When ordered hard to starboard, he immediately turned the ship's wheel until it was hard over. Hitchens stayed at the wheel for 40 more minutes before he was relieved. Hitchens was put in charge of lifeboat six, with the boat barely half full. They were ordered to return to the ship and take on more passengers, but the boat made for some lights on the horizon instead. Dead. After the ship sank, Hitchens overruled Margaret Brown in returning to save people from the water. He was made to give testimony on the sinking inquiries in both Britain and America. Despite the scrutiny he faced, he continued working on ships. He was separated from his wife in 1931, and he was among many searching for work in the Great Depression. In 1933, Hitchens brought a revolver to settle a grudge against a man named Harry Henley. He was arrested for attempted murder and imprisoned for four years. Hitchens died three years later at the age of 58, off the coast of Aberdeen, on the Ship, the English trader. Finish the Cape Race traffic. Uh, you can help with the accounts for that. Well, I got some clothes on. You think we'll have to turn back? Oh, don't say it. If we do, we won't get a moment's peace in here. Jack Phillips was one of two wireless operators on the Titanic. Born in Surrey in 1887, he, he attended a grammar school before he went to work in a post office at the age of 15 and trained in telegraphy. In March 1906, he left home to train at the Marconi Company's Wireless Telegraphy School in the Northwest. After graduating later that year, he worked on various ocean liners owned by the Cunard and White Star Line. He was assigned to work on the Titanic in March 1912, where he met his colleague, Harold Bride. The wireless machine broke a few days into the voyage. Against company regulations, Phillips and Bride worked tirelessly to fix it. Overtired from clearing a backlog, he told the California, which was reporting yet more ice warnings, to shut up. During the sinking, he frantically sent out CQD and SOS signals until the power went out, and Captain Smith relieved them from duty. Phillips and Bride were separated on the deck, but they managed to reach the overturned lifeboat. Phillips died of hypothermia and exhaustion while waiting for the Carpathia, and his body was never recovered. He had only just turned 25. Carpathia says they're making 17 knots. Full steam for them, sir. She's the only one who's responding. The only one close, sir. Says they can be here in four hours. Four hours? Harold Bride was the other wireless operator. He was born in London in 1890 and completed his training as a Marconi operator in June 1911. He served on the Haferford, the Lusitania, La France and the Anselm before he was assigned to the Titanic. Bride was asleep when the iceberg struck, and he frequently updated Captain Smith as to the whereabouts of the Carpathia and other ships. Not long after Smith had relieved them of duty, a crew member tried to take Philip's life belt while he was wearing it, too dedicated to his work to notice. Bride claimed to have hit the crew member, but didn't check to see if he survived or not. The wireless room began to flood, and both Bride and Phillips left. Bride became trapped under a collapsible bee, and had to wait until the ship sank from under him to escape. He climbed atop the lifeboat while waiting for the Carpathia. Bride was injured, and his feet had frostbite. On the Carpathia, he assisted with their operator in sending messages. Bride continued to work as a wireless operator, especially during the First World War. He met Lucy Downey in 1920, and they had three children. They lived in Glasgow after Bride changed careers to become a salesman. He died of lung cancer at the age of 66 in Glasgow. All the boats are away now, except for one or two of the collapsible kind. You must save yourself, you know. There'll be questions no one else will ever be able to answer. Possibly, possibly, it's something to consider. Mary Sloan was a stewardess on the Titanic who resided in Belfast. She was 45 when she embarked on the ship, though she claimed her age was 28. Like Violet Jessup, she was on the Olympic during the Hawk incident. She knew Thomas Andrews well and claimed that he died a hero. He encouraged her to get as many people out of their cabins as possible before putting on a life belt and getting onto the boat deck. She tried to go back for her belongings, but there was no time left. She was pushed into one of the final lifeboats to launch. She travelled widely for the rest of her life, living in places like Ohio and Japan. She married William Angus Gleason in 1919. 
He died in 1944, on the anniversary of the Titanic disaster. Sloane survived him by nearly nine years before she died near her hometown of Belfast at the age of 86 in February 1953. Frederick Fleet was one of the lookouts in the crow's nest when the iceberg was spotted. He was 24 at the time, having come to the White Star Line after growing up in a series of foster homes and orphanages after his mother abandoned him. He began his seafaring career in 1903. The Titanic was the first time he would serve as a lookout. They saw the impact, but assumed it was just a close shave. They were relieved from duty 20 minutes later. Fleet left the Titanic early in Lifeboat 6. Having seen the collision, he was required to participate in the inquiries. He left the White Star Line later in 1912, finding himself a pariah as the company wouldn't advance sailors who were on the Titanic. He married Eva Ernstein Legros in 1917 and they had a daughter. He worked as a sailor until 1936, as well as a shipbuilder and a master at arms. After his wife's death in 1964, he was evicted from his brother-in-law's house. Two weeks later, he died by suicide at the age of 77. Oh my God. I was going to shave, would he? Smell ice, can ya? Bleeding Christ. Reginald Lee was another lookout who saw the iceberg from the crow's nest. He was born in Oxfordshire in 1870, making him 41 in 1912. He married in 1897 to Emily Selina Hannah Hill, but had no children, and worked in the Royal Navy as an assistant paymaster before retiring in 1900. He was employed to work on the Titanic on 6th of April, after working as a lookout on the Olympic. He described the sea as being very calm and moonless, with a haze developing. They were relieved from duty at midnight and he returned to his quarters, where he encountered firemen fleeing the lower decks and water coming in. He helped launch several lifeboats on the starboard side before being assigned to lifeboat 13. They were swept into the path of the lowering lifeboat 15 by water being pumped from the ship, but they managed to escape in time. Lee reported hearing underwater explosions after the ship sank. This was more likely implosions from the water resistance before hitting the seabed. He was questioned about the lack of binoculars during the inquiry. Lee died of pneumonia the next year, possibly caused by the cold conditions in which the Titanic sank. He was 43. Arthur John Proust was a native of Southampton working on the Titanic as a fireman or stoker at the age of 24. By 1911 he was working at sea on ships like the Asturias and the Olympic. He was on the latter during the Hawke collision. Proust was one of many who could not get into a lifeboat and had to jump overboard. He was picked up by lifeboat 15. Like Violet Jessup, he also experienced the Olympic's three main disasters. During World War I, he survived the sinking of the Britannic, the Alcantara and the Donegal. He married in 1915 to Annie Hampton and had three sons. He retired from the sea under the belief he was a bad omen, as he had been on so many sinking ships. He died aged 49 of pneumonia in Southampton. Oh, what? what are you two doing down here? Frederick Barrett was Titanic's leading fireman. He was born in Lancashire in 1883. He began working at sea sometime near 1903 as a fireman on the Campania. The last ship he was on before Titanic was the New York, the same ship that nearly collided with the Titanic while departing from Southampton. At the start of the departure, he and several others were emptying a coal bunker in, in Boiler Room 6, which took until 13th of April to tackle. He was in Boiler Room 6 on 14th of April when he received the signal to shut all the dampers. Seconds later, water broke through the hull. Barrett escaped into Boiler Room 5 on the other side of the bulkhead and found the water was coming in through there as well. He stayed with the firemen to draw the fires in Boiler Room 5 until the bulkhead between Boiler Rooms 5 and 6 collapsed. Barrett made his way up top and climbed into Lifeboat 13. When Lifeboat 15 came down, Barrett rushed to cut the falls with his penknife, which saved the occupants from being crushed. A lady in the boat gave him a cloak, as he was only wearing light clothing from the heat of the boiler rooms. He testified at both inquiries before going back to work on the Olympic. He married Mary Ann Jones in 1915, and later lived in Liverpool as a timber labourer, before he died of tuberculosis in 1931, aged 48. How are things up top, sir? Any chance for us? Whatever happens, we've got to keep the lights going. I'll give the word when it's time to go, and then it's every man for himself. Joseph Bell was Titanic's chief engineer. He was a seasoned seafarer from Cumbria, who grew up on his father's farm before he went to Newcastle to train as an engineer. He joined the White Star Line in 1885, crossing the Atlantic several times. He married Maud Bates in 1893 and had four children. 
He was promoted to chief engineer on the Coptic in 1891. He also served on the Olympic and was therefore experienced enough to be transferred to the Titanic. On the 14th of April, he was given a sudden order to stop or reverse the engine to slow the ship down. After the impact, Bell and the rest of the engineers stayed behind to keep Titanic's lights on to aid in the evacuation and keep the wireless running to signal for help. After they had done all they could do, they went up top, but never made it off the ship alive. Joseph Bell's body was not recovered. He was 51 years old. Joseph Dawson was a trimmer on the Titanic. This involved handling and even distribution of coal throughout the ship. Dawson was born in Ireland in September 1888. He began working as a carpenter and builder's porter before he joined the army in 1908. His health was inconsistent, suffering boils, laryngitis, and had to have five teeth removed. He transferred to the army reserves in 1911 and signed onto the Titanic on 6th of April 1912. Dawson perished in the sinking, but his body was recovered and buried in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Because his grave marker says J. Dawson, fans of the James Cameron movie have mistakenly believed that this is the grave of Leonardo DiCaprio's character and have visited his grave with offerings of flowers. Joseph Dawson was 23 years old at the time of his death. That's fine. Be quiet. Too many people. Tessa, here, Tessa, please. I must have my jewels. I must have them. They're in the safe. I've got a seat here to prove it. Hugh Walter McElroy was Titanic's purser. He was born in October 1874 and grew up in a Catholic family in Liverpool. He was originally meant to be training as a priest before leaving after two years to join the Merchant Navy. He became a purser sometime around 1901 and served in the Boer War on the troop ship Britannic, not to be confused with the HMHS Britannic, and was awarded the Transport Medal and the South Africa Clasp. He served as a purser on several White Star Line vessels, including the Cedric, Majestic, Cumric and Olympic. He married in 1910 to Barbara May Ennis, whose brother had become a priest and performed the ceremony. They were living in Southampton by 1912, when McElroy was signed onto the Titanic on the 9th of April as chief purser. McElroy had a table in the first class dining room where he shared meals with passengers. McElroy was seen several times during the sinking where he assisted loading passengers into lifeboat 9. He had a firearm to stop passengers from crowding the lifeboats and fired his gun twice in the air after two men jumped into collapsible sea. He was last seen near the gymnasium. McElroy perished in the sinking. His body was recovered and identified by the Mackay Bennett crew. However, due to a shortage of caskets, he was buried at sea on the 22nd of April. He was 37 years old. Look there! Which way to the boats? Any way you like, friend. Any way you like. All roads lead to Rome. This way, Pat. Charles Jorfin was Titanic's chief baker and one of the more comical survival stories from that night. He was born in Birkenhead, Cheshire in 1878. He and his family moved to Liverpool sometime after his father's death in 1886. He married Louise Woodward in 1906 and they had two children. He was on Titanic as early as Belfast, previously working as chief baker on the Olympic. He was awakened by the impact of the iceberg and mustered other bakers to take up bread to the boat deck to be put into the lifeboats. He reported seeing third-class passengers rushing past him through second-class corridors. He was said to have drunk himself silly on the ship's supply of whiskey that night before he slipped into the water, but he personally claimed he had only one drink. He claimed he trod water for two hours before he came to Collapsible B and was allowed to cling onto the side until it met with another boat, which he was later brought into. The time he spent in the water is odd, as most people barely survive more than 15 minutes in the water that night. Despite popular belief, drinking alcohol doesn't warm you up and can increase your chances of hypothermia. He returned to Liverpool on the Olympic and, and served in World War I. He survived another shipwreck in 1916. He lost his wife to childbirth complications in 1919 and moved to America and became a citizen in 1930. He continued working as a baker on ships before his death in 1956 from pneumonia, aged 78. From this moment, no matter what we do, Titanic will founder. But this ship can't sink. She's made of iron, sir. I assure you, she can. Thomas Andrews Jr. was the Titanic's designer. He was a hard-working Irishman from Comber, County Down, born in 1873. He was working for Harland and Wolfe at the age of 16 as a premium apprentice. His uncle, Lord Piri, was principal owner of Harland and Wolfe. Andrews became general manager of Harland and Wolfe at the turn of the century and became a member of the Institution of Naval Architects. 
he married Helen Riley in 1908 and had a daughter. Such was Andrew's dedication to his profession that he would always travel on the maiden voyage of a new ship to see what improvements needed making and how to implement them into future vessels. He was on the Titanic as far back as Belfast during the sea trials, sending a letter to his wife over his satisfaction before the voyage. Andrews was well liked among the ship's employees. He would visit the engine room and the boiler rooms dressed in overalls to see how things were running. He stayed in cabin A36 and took most meals with the ship's surgeon, Dr O'Loughlin. Charles Jorfin made Andrews a loaf of soda bread during the voyage, which fought off homesickness. Andrews didn't really know there was a collision until Captain Smith sent for him and they went to check on the damage together. Andrews deduced that the Titanic would sink in the next few hours. He was seen during the evacuation urging passengers to get to the boat deck immediately. Testimonies claim he was last seen in the first class smoking room staring at a painting above the fireplace. But more recent sources claim he was last seen on the bridge with Captain Smith jumping into the sea. His body was never recovered. Andrews was 39 years old. It'll be a proud moment for you, Mr Chairman. Oh, and for you, Andrews. <laughs> You're the man who built her. You're the one who ought to take the bars. <laughs> I'm only the office boy. J. Bruce Ismay was one of the most controversial figures of the Titanic. Born in Crosby, Merseyside in 1862, Ismay's family founded the White Star Line. He was educated at Harrow, a prestigious boarding school in London, and studied in France before taking up the family business. He married Julia Florence Schifferlin in 1888 and had four children. He inherited ownership of the White Star Line in 1899 and was known to be a diligent businessman. He struck a deal in 1901 with J.P. Morgan for the White Star Line to join the International Mercantile Marine Company. In 1904, Ismay became president of the White Star Line and partnered with Harland and Wolfe in 1907. Ismay, like Thomas Andrews, was known to travel on a new ship's maiden voyage. Titanic was his pride and joy, but he travelled mainly as a passenger with his secretary and valet in cabins B-52, B-54 and B-56. He came to the bridge after the collision with the iceberg and was told the ship would sink. Ismay would be demonised for his decision to get into a lifeboat at the last minute and his reputation was in shambles for the rest of his life. To be fair, he did help getting passengers onto lifeboats and only left on one of the last ones. As he was on Murdoch's side of the ship, who let men on if there was space, he may have just been ordered into the boat by Murdoch. Ismay lived as a recluse until his death in 1937 at the age of 74. Ah, here you are, sister. You take this. Help keep you warm. Oh, no, please. Don't you worry about me. I got plenty of fat. Molly Brown was the most famous female passenger on the Titanic, though she was really called Margaret Brown and never called herself Molly. She was born in Hannibal, Missouri in 1867, the daughter of Irish immigrants. She moved to Colorado with her sister and brother-in-law aged 18 and worked as a seamstress. She met and married J.J. Brown in 1886 and had two children. In 1893, J.J. struck gold and the family moved to Denver, but struggled to fit in with high society. Margaret was something of a feminist, joining the Denver Women's Club to improve the lives of other women through educating them. She had a love of European things, learning French, German, Italian and Russian. She and J.J. separated in 1909, but remained on good terms until his death. In 1912, she was in Paris with her daughter when she received news that her infant grandson in America was ill. The Titanic was the first available ship and she boarded at Cherbourg. She was said to have kept up high spirits while encouraging other passengers into lifeboats before she was made to board lifeboat six. And on the Carpathia, Brown sought to distributing food and blankets to second and third class passengers and give them counseling. She raised $10,000 for destitute survivors and stayed on the Carpathia until all Titanic survivors were seen to. She gave Captain Rostrin a silver cup and medals to all the crew members. She was not allowed to testify at the inquiries, though. In 1914, she ran for the US Senate before working for the American Committee for Devastated France. She became an actress in later life before she passed away in her sleep from a stroke in October 1932 in New York. She was 65. Can we get on the boat, Mommy? <laughs> We're on the boat, darling. It's like a hotel to me. <laughs> See? See there, little darling? Wave to all the people. Goodbye to England. Bye, England! The Allison family were made up of Hudson Allison, a Canadian businessman, his wife Elizabeth, and their son and daughter, Trevor and Lorraine. They were travelling home on Titanic with four servants, including a maid they had recently hired named Alice Cleaver. They stayed in cabins C-22, C-24 and C-26, and two second-class cabins were booked for their servants. Children did not often join their parents in the dining room, but the Allisons brought Lorraine to dinner on the 14th of April so she could see it. 
After the collision with the iceberg, Alice was said to have taken baby Trevor while Hudson was checking the situation, and the Allison spent the sinking trying to find them. It was true that they were separated in the confusion. Alice and Trevor were seen into lifeboat 11 along with the Allison's cook. The Hudson, Elizabeth and Lorraine were separated from them and thought they were still on the ship. Elizabeth and Lorraine nearly got on a lifeboat, but Elizabeth refused to leave without Trevor. It is believed that they tried to get on collapsible A towards the end, but they were turned out of the boat due to a wave caused by the first funnel falling. Hudson's body was recovered from the water and buried in Ontario. His funeral was also on behalf of his lost wife and daughter. They were aged 30, 25 and 2 respectively. Little Trevor was taken in by his uncle where he died in 1929, aged 18, from food poisoning. Alice Cleaver herself died in 1984, aged 95. That is what makes it float. Do you think you ought to be doing that, Johnny? <laughs> Why not? Perhaps you'll need it. I'm sure they have more than enough. It's nonsense for us to be in these things anyway. This ship is unsinkable. The Astors were the richest couple on the ship. John Jacob Astor and his wife Madeline had a rather large age gap. The former was 47 and the latter was 18. JJ divorced his wife, Ava, a few years earlier and had married Madeline, which had caused a scandal in New York society. Astor already had grown children, the eldest of whom was older than Madeline. They left New York for Paris and Egypt before returning home on the Titanic in the hope that the gossip had died down. By this time, Madeline was pregnant. They stayed in cabins C-62 and C-64. During the ship's evacuation, the Astors were seen in the gymnasium where JJ opened his life jacket with a pocket knife to show Madeline what made it float. He asked Lytola if he could go with Madeline, owing to her condition, but he was refused. Madeline left in lifeboat 4. It is believed that JJ then went to free dogs in the kennel and was ultimately killed by the first funnel landing on him. However, his body was recovered and had no signs of being crushed. Madeline gave birth to a son some months later. She married twice more and died in Florida at the age of 46 in 1940. Excuse me, why have the engines stopped? I felt a shudder. The Countess of Ross, Lucy Noel Martha, was born in 1878 in Kensington, London. She married the Earl of Ross, Norman Evelyn Leslie, in 1900, and they had two sons. When she boarded the Titanic at the age of 33, she was travelling to Vancouver with her cousin Gladys Cherry. Her parents came to Southampton with her, but disembarked at Cherbourg. During the sinking, the Countess escaped in lifeboat 8, and even controlled the tiller on the boat. She remarried shortly after her husband's death in 1927 and died in Sussex in 1956, aged 77. Maybe, but you have nothing to reproach yourself with. You've done all any man could and more. You're not. I was going to say, you're not God, Mr. Lightoller. Colonel Archibald Gracie was one of the shortest living survivors of the Titanic. He was born in Mobile, Alabama in 1859, the son of a Confederate general who was killed in 1864. He graduated from St. Paul's Academy in New Hampshire, as well as West Point Military Academy. He became a colonel in the 7th Regiment of the United States Army. Along with his military career, he was a military historian and owned real estate. Gracie was returning from a vacation in Europe when he was travelling on the Titanic. He befriended 3rd Officer Pittman while travelling to Europe on the Oceanic. Gracie offered his protective services to women who were travelling in first class unaccompanied. He spent much of the voyage training in the gymnasium and spent the morning of 14th of April in the squash court before church. He went to bed early that evening and was awakened by a jolt when the ship hit the iceberg. He escorted women to the boat deck and saw them into lifeboats as well as gathering extra blankets. He tried to persuade Mrs Strauss to get on the lifeboat, but she refused to leave her husband. He assisted Lightoller with loading lifeboats and eventually jumped off the deck at around 2.15am and swam to the overturned collapsible B. He climbed onto the Carpathia at 8.30am, covered in cuts and bruises he didn't know he had. He later wrote an account of the ordeal, the truth about the Titanic, but he died before he could prove it. It was published posthumously. He died on 4th of December 1912, following a diabetic coma. Many Titanic survivors attended his funeral. Oh, and a touch of glamour at your table. You'll have heard of Miss Dorothy Gibson. Oh, I doubt it. Why should folks like you care about my crazy job? <laughs> Dorothy Gibson was an actress from Hoboken, New Jersey. She began her career in 1907 as a Broadway performer and became a model for magazines and postcards in 1909. This made her quite famous before she starred in motion pictures. Beforehand, actors in motion pictures tended to go uncredited. 
but Gibson already had star power. She worked for Eclair Studios for a series of films before she went on vacation in Europe with her mother. They embarked on Titanic at Cherbourg when Gibson was called home to resume work. She played cards with other passengers, well into the evening of 14th of April. She was on her way back to the cabin when she heard a sickening crunch that was the Titanic hitting the iceberg. She noticed the ship was listing and went to wake her mother. She and her mother left in Lifeboat 7. She recalled hearing the endless screaming throughout. After returning to America, she starred in the first ever Titanic movie, Saved from the Titanic. She gave up acting soon afterwards and became an opera singer. She married in 1917 to Eclair producer Jules Boulatour after he left his wife for her. They separated in 1919 and she moved to Europe with her mother. Unfortunately, Gibson became a Nazi sympathiser. However, she renounced her affiliation in 1944, where she was arrested by the Gestapo. She was imprisoned in saint Vitor in Milan, but escaped. Dorothy Gibson died in 1946 in Paris, aged 56. Oh, now, come on. You've got to have some nourishment after all. Come on, dear, you set them an example. Please don't do that. Just give it to somebody else, won't you, please? Every one of these ladies has just lost her husband. The Thayer family consisted of John Borland Thayer II, Marion Thayer, and their son, John Jack Borland Thayer III. John owned the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. They had travelled to Berlin to visit the American Consul General two weeks before they boarded on Titanic at Cherbourg, staying in cabins C-68 and C-70. They attended a dinner party for Captain Smith on the 14th of April. When the collision occurred, Jack went to investigate before telling his parents what happened. Jack, being 17, was too old to be allowed with the children into a lifeboat. Marion went off in lifeboat 4 on her own. John Thayer was last seen moving towards the stern of the ship. He perished in the sinking and his body was never found. He was 49. His son and fellow passenger Milton Long jumped off the ship at the last minute together. Jack swam to collapsible B. He said that the screams from people in the water reminded him of locusts. Though he and his mother were close by, they didn't recognise each other until they were on the Carpathia. Jack was one of many who testified that the ship split in half when it sank, and a passenger on the Carpathia, L.P. Skidmore, sketched his description. Although, the sketch claims that the ship split from the hull upwards. Marion and Jack returned to Pennsylvania. Marion never remarried and died in Haverford in 1944, aged 71. Jack attended University of Pennsylvania and married Lois Cassatt. They had two sons. Jack made a pamphlet about his experience in 1940, still haunted by the Titanic. Jack Thayer later died by suicide in September of 1945. He was 50 years old. Time for jumping. I'm for sliding down. You might land on a jack chair or something and hurt yourself. Yeah, you might get pulled under by the suction. Well, we'll see who's right. See you in New York. Maybe. Nice meeting you. Milton Long was from Springfield, Massachusetts. He was working as a clerk in a law firm after presumably attending Harvard and Columbia. His first experience with a shipwreck was in June 1911, when he was travelling on the SS Spokane in British Columbia. Following this, he travelled to Europe before returning home on the Titanic, boarding at Southampton, where he stayed in cabin D6. Not much is known about his actions during the voyage. He met Jack Thayer on the evening of 14th of April and stuck with Thayer throughout the sinking. They did not scramble for a lifeboat as the chaos began to worsen. Thayer and Long decided to jump off the ship, but disagreed on their descent. Long left the ship first, sliding down the side, and was never seen again. His body was recovered a few days later, and he was buried in his hometown of Springfield. His parents were later buried with him. He was 29 years old. Good. Daniel, my stomach's growling. Almost finished. Daniel, be careful, watch out. Daniel and Mary Marvin were a young, recently married couple from New York and Edinburgh, respectively. Daniel's family were founders of early motion pictures, and Daniel was a keen photographer and cameraman. He met Mary sometime between 1910 to 1911. They were married early in 1912 and later staged the wedding so it could be filmed. Theirs was the first wedding video. They took a belated honeymoon in Europe and boarded the Titanic at Southampton on their way home, staying in cabin D30. During the evacuation, Daniel saw Mary to a boat. His last words to her were, it's all right, little girl. You go. I will stay. Daniel perished in the sinking, and his body was not recovered. He was 18. Mary was found to be pregnant not long after, and gave birth to a daughter named Mary Margaret. Mary remarried to Horace Silliman de Camp on Christmas Day of 1913. Mary never spoke about her experience on the Titanic. She died in New York in October 1975, aged 81. Mr. Guggenheim. 
Well, thank you. We have dressed in our best and are prepared to go down as gentlemen. But we would like a brandy. Benjamin Guggenheim was a businessman from New York. Though he was married to Florette J. Seligman and they had three daughters, Guggenheim was distant from her and preferred to live in Paris. He took a mistress, Leontine Albert, before he boarded Titanic with her and his valet and chauffeur at Cherbourg. He was asleep during the collision but was woken up by Aubert. He is later quoted to have said, never mind icebergs, what is an iceberg? After dressing, he complained that his life jacket was uncomfortable. He changed into his best evening wear instead and, with his valet, declared, We have dressed up in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. If anything happens to me, tell my wife in New York that I have done my best in doing my duty. Guggenheim's body was never found. He was 46 at the time of his death. These are all quite free. Would you prefer that I left? Leontine Aubert was a French singer born in Paris in 1887. She was 24 when she embarked on the Titanic with Benjamin Guggenheim as his mistress. She had a Swiss maid with her, named Emma Sagasa. They were presumably evacuated in Lifeboat 9. The last words from Guggenheim were, We will soon see each other again. It is just a repair. Tomorrow the Titanic will go on again. Aubert had a nervous breakdown on Carpathia. She returned to Paris in May 1912 and continued living there. Some of her parties allegedly had to be shut down by the police. Aubert died at the age of 77 in October 1964. Well, tell him to save his money and invest it in something with a future, like vaudeville. Henry's a theatrical producer, Broadway. Henry Harris, how are you? Henry and Irene Harris were a theatrical couple, quite literally. Henry was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1866 and became the owner of the Columbia Theatre in 1895. He was already widowed by the time he married Irene Renee Wallach in 1899. Renee was born in 1876 in Washington, D.C. and was a law school student in New York, regularly attending the theatre when she met Henry. Henry produced several productions, including The Lion and the Mouse, and worked with famous figures like Lily Langtree, who was a mistress of King Edward VII. He and Renee were in London's West End working on a new production of Maggie Pepper before returning to America on the Titanic, boarding at Southampton. They stayed in cabin C83. On 14th of April, Renee was walking around the grand staircase when she fell and broke her elbow. This was owing to the linoleum of the steps being wet from being cleaned, and the list of the ship from coal down below being transferred from the starboard to the port side. She later refused to leave her husband during the evacuation and held off on leaving until she finally left in collapsible D. Henry perished in the sinking age 45. His body was never recovered. Renee married again three times but had no children. She continued to manage her late husband's three theatres but lost all three of them. In the Great Depression, she had to sell off her collection of antiques. By 1937, she was living in a one-room department in New York. She shunned an invitation to the premiere of the 1953 Titanic movie, but agreed to be interviewed by Walter Lord when he wrote A Night to Remember. She also helped promote its film adaptation. Renee died in September 1969, aged 93, in New York. Are there any spare hands here? I'll go, if you like. Are you a sailor? I'm a yachtsman. If you're seaman enough to nip down that lifeline, you can go. Major Arthur G. Putchin was the Canadian son of a railroad contractor. He was born in April 1859 and was educated in Montreal before enlisting in the Queen's Own Rifles in 1888. He was present at King George V's coronation in 1911 as a marshalling officer. He was quite wealthy, owning woodland in Alberta, and was president of the Standard Chemical Company, which manufactured acetone for explosives. He married in 1893 to Margaret Thompson and they had two children. He travelled a lot to maintain his business, the Titanic was the 40th time he crossed the Atlantic. He was vocally wary of having Captain Smith in charge, thinking he was too old for the job. He shared a table with the Allison family at mealtimes. He didn't think the ship was really sinking, but went to the boat deck all the same. Lifeboat 6 was lowering when it was found to be undermanned. He volunteered to go on the boat to assist, claiming he was a yachtsman. Lightoller had to improve it by climbing down to the boat, 25 feet below, using the ship's falls. When the boat was far away enough, he realised the ship was indeed sinking. Putin received backlash for his actions and for disparaging Captain Smith. He was branded as a coward, despite his demonstration of his experience by climbing down to the boat. Regardless, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel in May that same year. 
and received the officer's long service decoration. He served in World War I as a commander of the Home Battalion of the Queen's Own. He lost most of his wealth in the 1920s from bad business decisions and died in Toronto in December 1929, aged 70. We're crowded enough as it is. I'm feeling most unwell. It's difficult to say. Only one of us is a seaman. I think we ought to take his advice. The Duff Gordons were arguably more controversial survivors of the Titanic than J. Bruce Ismay. Lady Lucy Christina and Sir Cosmo Edmund Duff Gordon boarded the Titanic in Cherbourg, giving their names as Mr. and Mrs. Morgan. Cosmo was born in 1862 and educated at Eton College, inheriting his family's baronetcy in 1896. Lucy was born in June 1863. She married James Stuart Wallace, aged 18, but divorced him in 1888. She became a dressmaker to support herself, starting her own business in 1894, and gained popularity in having each dress have its unique style. Her customers involved the Duchess of York and Margot Asquith, wife of the Prime Minister. She expanded her business into America and France. She married Sir Cosmo because he was better at handling finances than her. Their marriage was not romantic in any sense of the word. Despite her success, her divorce made it impossible for her to be accepted at court. The Duff Gordons did not plan to sail on the Titanic, but they had to be in New York as soon as possible. So Cosmo and Lucy stayed in separate cabins on A-deck. Lucy recalled feeling a rumbling noise when the Titanic hit the iceberg, like a giant game of bowls. The Duff Gordons climbed into lifeboat one with Lucy's maid Laura. The lifeboat only had 12 people occupying it before it was lowered. After sinking, Sir Cosmo was later accused of bribing the other occupants with five pounds each not to go back to rescue people, when in truth he was offering the money to replace their lost possessions. They were the only passengers that were asked to participate in any of the inquiries. Sir Cosmo died in 1931, aged 68. Lady Lucy's business collapsed in the Great Depression. She died in 1935, aged 71. They are both buried in Brookwood Cemetery. Well, this isn't one of theirs. I'm just catching up with Fisher's work on proteins. Rather dull stuff, I'm afraid. You're a scientist? No, oh, nothing so colourful I teach. Lawrence Beasley was science master at Dulwich College, an all-boys school. He was born in Worksworth, Derbyshire in 1877. He had married Gertrude Cecile Macbeth and they'd had a son, but Beasley was widowed in 1906. He was boarding the Titanic from Southampton to visit his brother in Toronto, staying in cabin D56. He spent much of the voyage in the second-class library. He was reading in his cabin when the collision happened and felt his mattress move due to the vibrations. He didn't know the ship was sinking until he realised the stairs were at an odd angle. He put some books he'd taken with him into his pockets and headed onto A-deck. Lifeboat 13 was lowered to the window where he was standing, where he jumped in after confirming there were no women or children behind him. While waiting for the Carpathia, he helped a woman comfort her baby. Following the disaster, he wrote the first account of the Titanic sinking, which was published in June of that year. He married again to Muriel Greenwood in 1919. During the filming of A Night to Remember, Beasley attempted to gatecrash the set so he could go down with the ship properly this time. Unfortunately, he was noticed by the director and vetoed from doing so. His daughter-in-law was Dodie Smith of 101 Dalmatians and I Capture the Castle fame. Beasley continued teaching well into his 80s and became principal of Northwood School of Coaching. He died in February 1967, aged 89. Meizu Bumo Hosono was the only passenger of Japanese descent on the Titanic. He was a civil servant in Tokyo, born in 1870. He claimed that he was ordered to go to the lower decks by a crewman who thought he was steerage, but he defied them at the sight of the emergency rockets being fired, which filled him with dread. Confronted with his mortality, he admitted to the fear of death and not being able to see his family again, and that's what made him take a seat in lifeboat 10 when it was offered to him. Despite feeling obligated to stay behind and go down with the ship, he carried the only piece of stationery to leave the Titanic, a piece of paper with Titanic's letterhead. He used it to recount his experience and write to his family. Hosono was made a figure of ridicule on the Carpathia, but he didn't take their jokes lying down. When he returned to Japan, he was chastised and sacked for saving himself, and accused of several false acts, including stowing away and disguising himself as a woman. Refusing to die honourably was seen as contradictory to the samurai ethics of sacrifice. He was rehired owing to his work record and worked for the Ministry of Transport until his death in 1939, at the age of 68. His reputation never recovered. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Father Thomas Biles was a Roman Catholic priest from Leeds in Yorkshire. He studied mathematics and theology at Oxford and was ultimately ordained in 1902 in Rome after graduating from Gregorian University. He preached in Ongar, Essex between 1905 to 1912. He was 42 when he travelled on Titanic, boarding at Southampton, travelling to officiate his brother's wedding in New York. He wrote a letter to his housekeeper which left the ship at Queenstown. He gave mass on Sunday morning for second-class passengers, delivering sermons in French and English. Biles was on deck when the iceberg struck. He helped steerage passengers get into the boat deck and was said to have refused to get in a lifeboat twice. He remained on the ship until the very end, hearing the last confessions of passengers and praying with them. He died in the sinking and his body was never recovered. His brother got married anyway, but after the ceremony he changed into mourning clothes and returned to the church for a memorial mass. In 2015 he was beatified, so it is likely he may become a saint in the future. Father Josef Perlschiltz was a German priest from Bavaria. He was 41 years old when he sailed on Titanic, having been ordained in 1895. He lived at the Skian Monastery as an educator before he was offered a job at a Benedictine school in Minnesota to be the principal. He boarded the Titanic at Southampton, having spent Holy Week in Ramsgate. He held mass every day of the voyage and read in the second-class library. On Sunday morning, he assisted Father Biles in delivering mass to second-class passengers, giving sermons in German and Hungarian. Like Biles, Peroschiltz also perished in the disaster, while comforting passengers who were trapped on the ship. His body was never recovered. A memorial plaque was placed in Skian Monastery. Father Joses Monvia was a Lithuanian priest, born in 1885. He was ordained in 1908 at the age of 23 and worked as a vicar. He defied the Tsarist regime and offered his services to Uniates, a branch of Eastern European Christianity that acknowledges Rome, for which he was stripped of his vicarate. He decided to emigrate to America, boarding the Titanic via Southampton. He stayed on the ship when it was sinking, for which he was considered a hero in Lithuania and is awaiting canonization by Rome. His body was never recovered. He was 27. Give it to me. Daddy. It'll be fine, darling. Take her. Don't you worry. Give it to me. It's goodbye for a little while. Right. Only for a little while. The Reverend John Harper was a Baptist minister from Houston, Scotland. He and his daughter Nina were travelling on Titanic via Southampton to Chicago, where Harper was going to hold revival meetings at Moody Church, having been positively received there the previous year. He watched the sunset on the 14th of April, looking forward to a beautiful morning. During the evacuation, he wrapped his daughter in a blanket and carried her onto A deck, where she was put in lifeboat 11. Harper died during the sinking and his body was never recovered. He was 39. The LaRoche family were the only passengers on Titanic of African descent. Joseph Philippe Le Mercier LaRoche was born in 1886 in Haiti and studied as an engineer in France. He married Juliette Lafarge in 1908 and they had two daughters, Simone and Louise. Hoping for better job prospects in Haiti, the family left on the Titanic to return there via New York. Juliette was pregnant, so they decided to leave as soon as possible. They were going to travel on La France, but the accommodations would have separated them from their children, so they took second-class accommodation on the Titanic instead. They embarked at Cherbourg. It is presumed that Juliette and her daughters were put into lifeboat 8 or 10. Joseph remained behind and died in the sinking. His body was never found. He was 25. Simone and Louise were hauled onto the Carpathia in burlap bags, and Juliet had to steal napkins to use as diapers. They returned to France rather than go on to Haiti. Juliet died in Paris, aged 90, in 1980. Simone died in 1973, aged 64. Despite her ill health in early life, Louise Laroche lived to be one of the six remaining Titanic survivors by the time she died in 1998, aged 87. I don't suppose. First hand them over, sir. Their mother is not here, you see. They have only me. They'll be well looked after. Right, that's it. Laura, away. Three bravi, little boss. Three bravi. Soyez brave, mes enfants, soyez brave. Papa vous aime. A bientôt, hein? 
The Navratil boys, Edmund and Mikel, were toddlers in 1912. Unbeknownst to them, their father, Mikel Navratil, a Slovakian-French tailor, was kidnapping them after separating from his wife, Marcel. He assumed the name Charles Hoffman and called his sons John and Fred. The boys were taken to the boat deck during the sinking. Lightoller would not let their father board, so the children were put in a boat without him. Navratil begged them to tell their mother that he still loved her and that he expected Marcel to follow them to America, where they could live happily ever after. He never saw them again, as he died in the sinking. His body was recovered from the water with a revolver in his pocket. He was buried in Baron de Hirsch Cemetery in Nova Scotia. His boys were looked after by fellow survivor Margaret Hayes until their mother recognised their photograph from the newspaper. She reunited with them in May and took them home to France. Edmund became an interior decorator and served in World War II in the French army. He died in 1953, aged 43. Mikel became a psychology professor. He was the last male survivor of the Titanic, dying in 2001, aged 92. He would say of his father after watching the James Cameron film that he hoped he didn't suffer long in the icy water. What's the use? Nobody's listening to us anyway. Well, they don't listen to us at dinner either. Come on, let's play. Keep us warm. Wallace Hartley and the Titanic's musicians are probably the most famous story of the Titanic. The ship's orchestra was made up of eight people, all of whom went down with the ship. The orchestra was made up of string instrumentalists, save for Theodore Ronald Braley, who played the piano. Roger Marie Bricou, Percy Cornelius Taylor, and John Wesley Woodward played the cello. John Frederick Preston Clark played the double bass, and John Law Hume and George Alexandra Crin and Wallace Hartley played the violin. Hartley was the bandmaster, aged 33. The rest were aged between 20 and 40. Hartley headed a quintet in the first class dining room and during the church service, while a trio of Crin, Bricou and Braley played in the a la carte restaurant and Café Parisienne. During the sinking, the full band joined on the deck to play in order to calm the passengers with light-hearted music. Towards the end, we usually see Wallace Hartley starting to play Nearer My God to Thee, to which the rest of the band join in. They were said to have kept on playing until the very end. A memorial concert was held in May of 1912 at the Royal Albert Hall. Hartley, Clark and Hume's bodies were recovered. Clark and Hume were buried in Nova Scotia, while Hartley was returned to his family and buried in his native Lancashire. Hartley's violin was also recovered from the water and was sold at auction for $1.6 million in 2013. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. The Goodwin family were made up of Frederick Goodwin, his wife Augusta, and their children, William, Charles, Lillian, Jesse, Harold, and baby Sidney. The family were living in Wiltshire, England, before travelling on the Titanic from Southampton. Frederick had been offered a job at a power station in Niagara Falls. Due to the 1912 coal strike, they were transferred from their original vessel to the Titanic. The entire family lost their lives during the sinking. It is possible they made it up onto deck, but couldn't get on a lifeboat in time, as the body of Sydney was found in the water by the Mackay Bennett crew several days later. His was one of the first bodies recovered. The sailors, who had been paid a bonus by the Astors to recover the body of JJ Astor, used the money to pay for Sydney's funeral at Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and served as pallbearers. Sidney's identity went unknown until 2008, so his grave marker simply displays unknown child, but it is considered a memorial to all the children who were lost in the disaster. This way, please, this view, right here. Big boat, huh? Daddy, it's a ship. You're right. The Sage family were a family of 11. John Sage and his wife Annie had nine children. Stella, George, Douglas, Frederick, Dorothy, Anthony, Elizabeth, Constance and Henry. John was working as a baker in Peterborough. George, the eldest son, left with his father for Canada, where they worked as bakers until they purchased a fruit farm in Florida. They returned to Britain to take the whole family to live on the fruit farm. They planned to sail on the Philadelphia, but the coal strike put them on the Titanic instead and boarded at Southampton. During the sinking, 20-year-old Stella was put in a lifeboat before getting out again, refusing to leave her family behind. The whole family perished in the sinking. Anthony, who was only 12, was recovered but later buried at sea. I see him! Pull! 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 Put your backs into it! Go ahead, I see him! Put your backs into it! Go ahead, I And hold water! 
Fang Lang, or Fong Zoom, was an immigrant from either China or Hong Kong. He travelled with seven other Chinese passengers in order to reach Cuba via America. He is believed to have been 17 when he travelled on the Titanic. He went down with the ship, but was one of four people saved from the sea by 5th Officer Low. He managed to keep himself out of the water by balancing himself on a wooden door. He was not able to enter the United States because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and was kept aboard the Anetta until moving on to Cuba. He was shaken from the experience and never talked about the Titanic afterwards. He died aged 91 in January 1986. The Andersen family were a family of seven from Sweden. Anders Johan Andersen and his wife Alfreda and their five children, Ebba, Ellis, Ingeborg, Sigrid and Sigvard. Anders is only listed as a general labourer before he decided to emigrate with his family to America. They boarded at Southampton with the American Danbom family, consisting of Ernst, his wife Anna and their four-month-old son Gilbert. Also in their company was Miss Anna Sophia Nisten. During the sinking, the company gathered on the boat deck. Anna would be the only survivor, being placed into lifeboat 13. She was distressed to see families being separated from each other. She also reported that she had heard the ship cracking. The only body found out of their company was Ernst Danbom. His remains were buried in his home state of Iowa. Anna Nisten continued to live in America. When she attempted to visit Sweden in 1953, she suffered a traumatic episode when the ship she was travelling on stopped. She had three sons before her death in 1977, aged 87, from surgery complications. I understand if some of these stories have upset you. I know they upset me when I was writing them for the script. I wish I could have told you the story of each passenger and crew member, but there just isn't enough time. No matter how many times we go back and analyse the mechanics, the timing, the exact angle her bow rose from the water before she split, you have to keep reminding yourself that people suffered and died that night. Every lifeboat was carrying a human soul who would be irrevocably changed from the experience. No matter how many times James Cameron goes and looks at the wreck and makes a new documentary or pulls out a banana, he asserts that you must never forget the people who were on that ship. And I'm never going to forget the stories of what I've researched. All that strength. Cheers. Tell them no, nothing. Everything that was humanly possible has been done. Three years. I thought of nothing except Titanic, but I never got it. I never let it in. Thank you to everyone who managed to get to the end of this video. It honestly was not meant to be this long. Originally, the Titanic history video was just meant to be one video. Then I thought about there's so many details that it's just not optional to skim over all that happens. Otherwise, you end up being like that guy in the James Cameron movie where it just shows like this guy's completely desensitized to the tragedy. But I'm not desensitized to the tragedy. In fact, it's been quite upsetting reading about all these people who died and which people suffered from the trauma afterwards. It's been a very moving experience, so I'm glad that we've managed to overcome it at last and now we can finally move on to the Titanic rankings. This month I'm also going to try and get Catherine Howard Part 3 out. I've decided to split the usual video essay I give after a rankings video in half this time because there was a lot to say about Catherine Howard and, and I don't want another video as long as this, so let's hope I can get that done by the end of the month. Tell you what, as I'm recording this, it's the 13th of April. In two weeks, it's my birthday. So if you guys can spend the next couple of weeks subscribing and getting your friends to subscribe, just so I can get to 4,000, we can start May off with a 4K subscriber special. That would be great. Yes, the Titanic ranking videos, because they're going to be split into several different individual videos just for the sake of my sanity. Otherwise, that's looking at a two hour video because there is a lot to say. Those will come out in the next however many weeks and they'll probably be finished by the end of May. There's 17 of them. <laughs> I've pretty much started on most of the scripts. It's just a matter of finishing them. But anyway, I really hope you found the video informative and you can go back to all of these Titanic movies and you can spot them in the background now. So let me thank my patrons, and remember if you want to support the channel you can always become a patron. You can start as low as $1.50 or a pound, and you'll be in the Lord and Lady tier. 
and the King and Queen tier is the highest tier in which you will get a shout out in the credits, just like Anastasia Gracia, Alison Cuff and Larissa here, who have been amazing in supporting this channel, even through all the ups and downs. Okay, so let's get started on the rankings.